said is that we have, it takes away from the fellowship, and so we just want to wish all of our people who watch us via Facebook, you know, we welcome you guys, we hope you can join with us every Sunday and every Wednesday as well. We want to encourage you to go to our website, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. We want to encourage you to go to our YouTube page, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. You can follow us online. You can listen to all our messages online. And as always, uh, we have links uh, in all of our boxes, whether they be online or whether they be on YouTube, whether they be on Facebook. If you want to give, you can be able to be a part of that as well. Amen. So we want to thank you guys for it. Amen. Well, amen. Amen. Well, we have been in Revelation 15. That's where we are, and we're going to continue to go there. We'll conclude it on today. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've been trekking through this book. And uh, it's been an a, a awesome journey. Uh, every week it is uh, just refreshing. And I'm telling you, just from a pastoral standpoint of being able to study out this book, uh, it, it's, it's, all, it's been a blessing to me. I mean, it's just awesome the things that you see and you, 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 that are right there in Scripture, being able to go and uh, chase down these beautiful truths that God has in His Word. And so uh, we thank God for the opportunity to study this book. This book is the only book in the Bible that has a blessing on it for those who read it and adhere to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great opportunity to study it out as we walk through it and, ex and exposit it. So we want to go back to Revelation 15. Okay. Like I said, today we're going to go to the conclusion of Revelation 15, uh, which is the prelude, if you will. It's a prelude to the final outpouring of the wrath of God, which will begin in Revelation uh, chapter 16. And on last week we talked about how the wrath of God is one of the major themes woven into scripture, both Old and New Testament. And it's important that you understand that the wrath of God is not something that, you know, the holiness church came up with, or it's not something that, you know, uh, people came up with to try to scare people into heaven. The wrath of God is a theme that runs throughout scripture. It is a theme that runs throughout the biblical narrative. And remember, if you remember on last week, we kind of walked you through different scenes through the Bible, whether it begins with the flood and then all the way to AD 70 with the destruction of uh, the temple in Jerusalem and Israel uh, and all those things that happened. We've seen these pockets of the wrath of God, but when we go through Scripture, we see it there. We see it in the Scriptures. And so, whereas, listen to this though. However, here's the thing, the reason why the wrath of God is such an elusive topic to most believers is because God's wrath is not intended for the church. God's wrath is not intended to the church. And it's, and it's a wonderful study that you can do as you go and look through Scripture to kind of prove this point. Well, listen to this. Whereas every age within Scripture has experienced the visible and the physical display of God's wrath within every age throughout Scripture, whether it be in the beginning when you have uh, Adam, Adam, and then you have Noah, then you have uh, Abraham, then you have uh, Moses, you have Israel, you have the law, all those different ages of, of that, that, that are woven in Scripture, you can go there and you have seen the visible and the physical wrath of God on display. Mm -hmm. Think about that. The <laughs> only age that we have not seen truly the wrath of God in visible, physical display is the church age. This is the age that we're in now. Mm. According to, uh, to Paul in, Re in Ephesians chapter 6, we're in the dispensation of grace. Now that's not dispensationalism, right, right, right. but that it, all the word dispensation means is an administration, a, a, a way that God is dealing with his people and the world at that time. It doesn't necessarily mean in dispensationalism, but it is a picture there of, of age. I think the word age is a better word. Age, because that's what the Bible talks about. And so, within the church age, we have never experienced an outpouring of God's wrath on the earth against sin. Do you, I want you to think about this. Within every age, we have experienced it. Whether it be with Adam and Eve all the way to Noah. That was the flood. Y'all remember? With Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah. With Moses... Egypt. Mm -hmm. Throughout the history of the law, we saw it with the nation of Israel. We talked about that. 722, the northern tribes were wiped out. 586 B.C., the southern tribes were wiped out. You see? 
Even when we go all the way to the New Testament with the advent of Christ, we see the wrath of God on display at the cross. Like we said, that's more of a spiritual understanding of it. It, it physically happened. But then we really see the visible display of God's wrath in AD 70. But since then, we have not seen God's wrath in visible, physical display. Do you understand what I mean by visible, physical display? You see, we haven't seen God's wrath in a flood. We haven't seen God's wrath in two in cities being annihilated. You get what I mean? An entire nation being completely obliterated. We haven't seen that. We haven't seen that in full display. Somebody said, well, we had some wars. Yeah, we had some wars in the 20th century, but that wasn't the wrath of God. That was the ignorance of man. Right. Okay. <laughs> that was the, that, that, that was the, the sin of man. Right. But we haven't seen it like that. And there's a reason for it. I believe that this is one of the great many blessings given to the church that subsequently benefits the world. I want you to think about this. Look at Genesis 18. In Genesis 18, we're setting up this thing because the reason why we're talking like this because when we talk about the wrath of God, as believers, we have no connection to it. And that's good. That's good. We should not have a connection to the wrath of God. <laughs> that should not be what we're looking to see. <laughs> but I think because of it, we don't have really any understanding of it. We don't have any, what's the good word there? Uh, any type of a basis for it. Point of reference. That's excellent. Yeah, a point of reference for it. And there's a reason being because I think God establishes something different with the church. The church has a set of unique blessings. The church hasn't replaced Israel. Israel has its own blessings. Israel will visibly and physically, naturally reign with Christ in his millennial reign. Israel, the nation Israel, the, the true nation of Israel. I'm not talking about what's going on with Netanyahu and all that over there. I'm talking about the true nation of Israel. Y'all follow me? They will rule and reign with, the, with their Messiah. They will have their Messiah. Yes. Y'all do understand that, right? Jesus is coming back for as the Messiah to Israel. They rejected him the first time. He's coming back as their Messiah. He comes to get the church. We're gone. You follow that? Uh -huh. You see? And so the blessings to the church are not the blessings to Israel. And sometimes that can be very difficult because we read certain... That's why... That, that's, how, that's where the prosperity thing came in because there were visible physical blessings to given to Israel. Right, that's right. And when the church, when there was no Israel for over 1,800 years, the church just assumed all of those blessings. Right. So we took Deuteronomy 28, mm -hmm. and that became us. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed going in and blessed going out. And I'm not saying that we're not blessed. But if you really want to find the blessings of the church, you can read Ephesians 1. Right. You can read Ephesians 1. You can study out the book of Romans. that tells us in Romans chapter 5 that now that we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's what the believer has. The believer has certain prayers that we have. But do you know one of the greatest hopes of the believer is called the blessed hope. The blessed hope is the rapture. Uh -huh. I don't know if y'all understand that. The blessed hope according to scripture is that we will be spared out of, taken out of the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. And when you go to Genesis 18, you see this establishment there. Can you cut me up just a tad bit, Ron? In Genesis 18, Look at verse 23 and 26. Now, Genesis 18 has to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. But listen to what happens. Now, this is when three men were visiting with Abraham. Right. And look at what happens in 22. Genesis 18, uh, yeah, 22. 
So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Come on. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Will you sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Okay, you can cut it down just a little bit. It's got a little boxy sound. Far be it from you. Now listen to how Abraham is talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Right. So what is just? What, what was Abraham saying? What would be just? Just is that the righteous... Do not fare as the wicked. Right. Now what do we mean by that? Is the just saying that the righteous should be blessed and the wicked should be cursed? No. The, 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 the faring like the wicked is, why should the righteous be swept away in judgment, mm -hmm. swept away in wrath, right. like the wicked? Mm -hmm. That's the question that's being pr presented here. And the Lord said, if I find in, at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Right. Now, if we, you, now, you know, if you keep going through the right. scenario, Abraham keeps going with him. Mm -hmm. So when you jump down to 32, he says, here's Abraham. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. Mm -hmm. angry. And I will speak again but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. Right. He answered and said, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Wow. As a matter of fact, when we get to Genesis chapter 19, right, come on. verses 20 through 22, this is when Lot says, okay, I can't make it out of the city. It, 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 it's too far for me to run the way you're telling me to run. He says, but there's another city I can go to. It's a little one. Let me make it there. And in verse 20, in Genesis 19, 20, he says, Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. It is not, is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, this is the angel speaking, I will grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. So not only did God say, I will not destroy the city if they're ten. What was he really saying? If it was just one righteous person in that city, I would have spared the city. Because why did God spare the city of Zoar? Because Lot was there. You see how God establishes something. What does that establish to us? That God will not bring his wrath and judgment against the wicked while the righteous are still there. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, come on, guys. I, I, this is scripture. We also see this in the New Testament. Just a quick verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. This is Paul talking about marriage. Look at this. It says in verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is made holy or set apart because of his wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy or set apart because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Wow! So what God says there is, if you have a believing spouse and an unbelieving spouse, the house is is set apart and blessed because of the believing spouse. Right, 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 right. Meaning that the unbelieving spouse doesn't experience the wrath, doesn't experience the condemnation that comes with their sin. They don't experience that all because the believing spouse is there. And the kids are set apart unto God. Why? Because of the believing spouse. What I'm trying to show you guys, that God establishes that sinners are benefited by the presence of God's chosen people in their midst. Right. What we see through our scripture is that wherever there are God's people in the midst of sinners, the sinners 
its benefit right. because of the presence of God's people. Right. Y'all yeah, follow that? You, you, it's so many issues, things you can think about this. This is why we tell you as a believer, when you go on your job, if you are the only believer there, do you realize that place is, is, is blessed? Because you're there. Not because you're all of that. You're not all of that. It's because of what God has established in Scripture. Throughout the span of the church age, the world and sinners have never once experienced the outpouring of God. Now think about outpouring of God's wrath. Think about what we read in the Old Testament. This proves to you that the church is a blessing to the world. Because the church is in the world, and mom, we're not an American Christian nation. We're not a Canada, all the Christians in Canada, all the Christians over in Europe, all the Christians over in Germany. No, the church is spread out where? All over the world. Whether it be in China, whether it be in Iran, whether it be in Iraq, there are believers in Africa, there are believers here, there are believers in Canada. We're spread out because the church is here, the world is benefited because of our presence. Because, Elder Charles, the church is here, the world has never experienced the unleashing of God's wrath. Isn't that something? Somebody says, well, there's been a lot of bad things happen. Yes, bad things happen in a fallen world. But it's not the wrath of God. Katrina was not the wrath of God. 9-11 was not the wrath of God. Do y'all understand that? If 9-11 was the wrath of God, New York would be blown up. It would be gone. The whole state would be removed. Right. See, I want you to get a picture of the wrath of God. If the wrath of God was to be unleashed on this country, America would be obliterated. Right. 330 million people would die and God wouldn't blink an eye. That's the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not two planes flying into a building and 3,000 people lose their lives and some people missed it out. Or the wrath of God is a Katrina, a storm comes along and some people hawk some TV, some folk die because they didn't want to leave. The wrath of God is some uh, her, uh, uh, earthquake that happened over in California. That's not the wrath of God. <laughs> but the wrath is, is going, the wrath of God will be visibly experienced. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. Because God has made these wonderful promises to the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9-11. through 11, For God has not destined us for wrath. This is the church. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. We're supposed to build up each other with this. And what are we building above each other? God going to get you out. God going to bless you. God, No, you build each other the same. You're not destined for wrath. Mm -hmm. Don't you know, man, that, that when, the, when the wrath starts, we're going to be out of here. Mm -hmm. We're going to be gone. Do you believe that? Do yeah. you believe that blessed hope? Wow. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. What does he tell the church of Philadelphia? Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to those to, to try those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from it. The church is a blessing to this world, and that is the very thing that they're trying to remove. And they don't understand, oh my God, Jimmy, that once the church leaves, then now they will experience the visible, physical outpouring of God's wrath. It will go back to like what we read about in biblical days. And right now, we have no connection to that. And you want to know why, Nancy? Because that's a blessing of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the blessing of God, I, oh my, I wish I could explain it better. The blessing is, Lindsay, we have no connection to it. Even when we're hearing about it, Raymond, we just don't have, that's, God says, no, 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 that's a blessing. I've given you that. That your mind has never seen me work like that. You never have to worry and fear like that to know that I'm about to obliterate a state. I'm about to take out. The, no, because that's a great blessing given to the church. I'm at peace with you because you have placed faith in my son. Your sins have been covered. Every ounce of wrath I had for you, I unleashed it on my son at the cross. Amen. I have expended all of my wrath for you on him. Mm. So therefore, you will never have to experience one drop, one second, one nanosecond of the wrath of God. As a believer, you will never, ever experience it. Ever. You will only know God is love, only know God is grace, only know God is forgiveness, only know his blessing, only know his fulfillment, only know his purposes and plans and promises. That's it. That's all you'll ever know. That's all we'll ever know. We will never see these things with our eyes. That's a blessing to the church. But the book of Revelation reveals that a time is coming in which the church age will come to an end and God's wrath will be poured out on sinners in devastating judgment. Look at what it says. Just write these down. Job 21, 29 verse 30 says, the evil man will not be rescued in the day of wrath. There's no rescue for the evil man. Romans chapter 2 verses 3 through 5 says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself, on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgments will be revealed. Wow. Paul says that sinners today, back then, today as well, are storing up wrath for themselves that will be unleashed on the coming day of wrath. A day is coming in the near future when every sinner that is alive at that time will come face to face with the wrath of God. And I'm, not talk, I'm not talking about the wrath in eternal wrath when they go to hell. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about face to face with the physical, phys, phys, visible physical wrath. They're going to see it. They're going to see the waters turn to blood. A time is coming when this planet will experience over three and a half billion people will die. The, the world will experience a time that when Christ's foot touches the ground, every sinner that is alive at that time will be slaughtered. Mm. We have no connection with <laughs> We don't know what that looks like, y'all. <laughs> and I don't want to know. Because listen to what John the Baptist says in John chapter 3, verses 35 through 36. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Wow. Notice what John the Baptist says. Whoever does not obey the Son, he shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains remains on him. Why is that important? He didn't say it because he doesn't obey the Son, the wrath of God comes on him. No, because he doesn't obey the Son, the wrath of God remains on him. You want to know what that means? Before you got saved, it was on you. <laughs> See, we had this picture that, that, that everybody comes to this world innocent, and then when they see it the first time, then it comes on them. No, no, no. When you came to this world, the wrath of God was on you. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, God is angry with the wicked every day. Uh 
<laughs> you hear me? And so what sets that apart is faith in Christ. Every sinner is continuously under the wrath of God, but a time is coming in which every sinner that is alive on the planet at that time will have the wrath of God poured out on them in horrific judgment. Guys, remember, what is the what did we read in Revelation 14, 19? So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the great harvest of the earth. And what did he do with it? Made some good grape juice. No, he threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And Revelation 15 is a prelude to that final outpouring. Are y'all still with me? Mm -hmm. What does Revelation 15 verse 1 says? Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. Mm -hmm. Last Sunday I told you that this chapter is sort, of, is sort of like a theodicy of God, whereas it reveals two main justifications for God's final outpouring of wrath. Now watch this. It, I'm not saying that God needs a justification for why he does what he does. Mm -hmm. But in God's goodness, remember, why does it seem like Revelation 15 is a justification? Because Revelation 15 is written to who? It's written to the church. Y y y okay, y'all get it? Revelation is not written to the world. Right. Jesus wrote it, gave it to John, so he can give it to who? The church. He didn't say, I want you to write this, and I want you to take it down to the mission. I want you to try to get legislation passed with this. No, he didn't say that. It's given to the church. Do you guys understand that? Do y'all understand that? The Bible is written to the church. Right, right, right. The Bible is written to God's people. The natural man understandeth not the things of God. He can't comprehend them. Do y'all understand that? Right. So while we're trying to get the Bible into the world and all these kind of things, they wouldn't get it anyway. I don't want to talk about stuff like that because these are things that we'll get passionate about. About That's a shame they took the Ten Commandments off the courts because what the, 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 the courts weren't honoring the Ten Commandments anyway. They don't honor God. Mm -hmm. right, right. Now, do, do you realize, I mean, today you can have a president, uh, all the presidents, they put their hand on the Bible and swear. Yeah. Amen. And then proceed to do exactly everything that's opposite that's in the book. Right, right. All right. <laughs> Y'all do realize that doesn't make any sense. So no, the Bible is written to God's people. The New Testament was written to the church. Revelation is written to us. So when we read Revelation 15, it's not a justification to the world why God is doing what he's doing. It's telling us. God says, I, I, I share everything with you guys. And what do we say the two main reasons are? Number one, the vengeance of God. That's verses one through four. We, we dealt with that last week. And number two, what we'll deal with this uh, today is the eternal purpose and redemptive plan of God. Why is God pouring out this wrath? Number one, because of the vengeance of God. Number two, because of the plan and purpose of God. Let's read Revelation 15, verses five through eight. You follow along while I read. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness is in heaven was open. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke, from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Hmm. Look at verse 5. Go back to verse 5. Notice what it says. After this I looked. What is that? That's our marker. That's our marker. After this. What did we say that is? The word after that is after this is metatauta. Remember, that's the marker that runs throughout Revelations. It lets us know that this is a new sequence of visions. And this is important in our study because the last metatauta, or the last after this, was at the beginning of the blowing of the seven trumpets. So the last after this was at the beginning of the blowing of the seven trumpets. 
Again, this means that what John is seeing and what is given to him is given to him in sequential order. Not a retelling of the same story in different ways. This is so important because most of the Protestant church views the book of Revelation as a retelling of the victory of Christ seven different ways. They do not take it literal. This is the majority of the church. The reason why I'm telling you that, because if you talk to somebody and you start talking about Revelation, they may look at you like you're a fool. Mm -hmm. So you really believe all that stuff in there? Mm -hmm. You do realize that all that is allegory. It's just talking about the victory of Jesus. You, you do understand that. No, this proves it because what John is given is given to him in sequential order. In other words, after this, this happens. After that, this happens. After this over here, that happens. That's sequential. Y'all do understand that, right? That's sequential. The seven bowl judgments come after the seven trumpets. That's how it rolls. Notice that John sees next is the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven open. Now this is important again. What this means is that we are now getting ready. This is amazing. Do you realize, right when we read that verse in chapter 5, y'all still with me? Uh -huh. We're picking back up the story from at Revelation 11. Huh. Now we're in Revelation 15. Uh -huh. The last time we left off with the sequence of order, the seventh trumpet was blown. Uh -huh. And the kingdom of our God had become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And God, Jesus was getting ready to reign. And then all of a sudden, we stop there, we go to chapter 12, it's a war in heaven. We go to chapter 13, that's the Antichrist. We go to chapter 14, that's the three angels. You see, we have this break. Uh -huh. Now we are picking back up the story in Revelation 11. Very important as you study the book. And let me prove it to you. Notice that it says in Revelation 15, 5, After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. Go, go back to Revelation 11. Look at verses 15 through 7, uh, 19. Let's look at this. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, and for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of the covenant was seen within the temple. Notice that that's how Revelation 11 ends. Where do we pick back up that scene again in Revelation 15.5? Because what is the first thing John sees in Revelation 15, 5? After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. I'm going to show you. That's the same thing. So John is picking back up the story. See, guys, chapters 12 through 14 was an interlude to set up the events that came from the blowing of the seventh trumpet, which officially begins the great tribulation and the consummation of all things. At the blowing of the seventh trumpet, that officially begins the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, and the consummation of all things. So, But in order for us to understand that, John has to give us the backdrop. He has to give us the setup. The Holy Spirit gives us an understanding of what takes place to set up the last three and a half years. Uh -huh. Y'all yeah, yeah, get it. Y'all yeah, just say it. Yeah. How does he set it up? In Revelation chapter 12, first thing he sees, Israel. Uh -huh. Okay, so that sets up the, uh, the... Then what else does he see? The dragon. That's Satan. He also sees a war in heaven where the dragon and his angels were removed. Uh -huh. You get it? That's setting up the last three and a half years. And then when the dragon is removed, Mom, what's the next chapter? Chapter 13. What does that happen? That's the rise of the Antichrist, the beast. Uh -huh. And then what do we see at the rise of the beast? The whole world worships the beast. 
What happens also during that time? The mark of the beast is implemented. You can't buy or sell unless you have the mark. And then in chapter 12, chapter 14, he gives us a preview at the end of the victorious 144,000. Then we see, we read about three angels that preach messages across that span of little time there. Chapter 15 now sets us up for what's getting ready to happen in chapter 16. Uh -huh. The book does flow. Yes. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Uh -huh. I'm hoping that after this study, it won't be as hard to read Revelation. Right. Because a lot of people get confused, especially when you get to those middle chapters. You're like, you know what, where, where, where are we? <laughs> That's where we are right now. So the blowing of the seventh trumpet is the end of the kingdom of this world and the beginning of the kingdom of the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. And God is telling you, 12 through 14 gives us how it all happens. Now, what exactly is the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven? The Greek says, it, here's how the Greek reads that verse in Revelation 15, 5. It says, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony was opened. So the question is, let me start off with this. Is John seeing a literal temple in heaven that is some type of physical structure that God is sitting inside? Because this is important. Because when we think of heaven and we read about the temple in Revelation, we automatically think, is God sitting in a temple? Now here's the question. We have to get it. Why is John being shown these things? Y'all, I, I, I want to take you this because this will help you understand even as you interpret the word. Write down 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 27. 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 27. Let's establish this point. Let's, let's first go over this point. Is God sitting inside a temple? Now look at what it says. This is Solomon now dedicating the temple of Solomon. He's dedicating it to the Lord. Now look at what Solomon says in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. He says, But will God, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Solomon got it. Solomon got that this house or this temple was only symbolic. Right. He says the highest heavens cannot contain God. Why is that? Because God is omnipresent. What is the word omnipresent? That's not the omni downtown. The omnipresent <laughs> is present everywhere at the same time. Y'all get that? When we say that God is omnipresent, we're saying he is everywhere at the same time. We're not saying, Elder Charles, he is everything. Right, right. That's, <laughs> that's wrong. That's pantheism. No, we're not saying God is everything. Because when people say omnipresent, that's the first thing they go to. Well, God everywhere. See, God in that tree. God in them chairs. God is it? No, God in no tree. He's transcendent. God lives outside of his creation. Y'all get that? God is not a part of his creation. God lives outside of it. What does that mean? I don't know. He doesn't live in it. So he's not a part of creation. So when we say this, God isn't sitting in a temple in heaven. Okay, when we get to heaven, don't look for some temple. Right. Right. When we get to heaven, we're just going to experience the presence of God. Right. <laughs> and we will be at a place, but God will fill it all up. It's not like, oh, look at the big temple. Man, it's got all man. It looks like one of the churches down top. No. No. As a matter of fact, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Listen to what Isaiah says. 
Because when we talk about omnipresence, that means God, he, he, he lacks locality. God is not somewhere. Y'all get it? He's not somewhere. The man upstairs. It's because if he's upstairs, that means he can't be downstairs. I like what David said. If I make my bed in hell, there you will be. Woo! That'll mess some people up. How will the people in hell still experience the presence of God? Not in grace and glory. Raymond just said it. They will experience God in his eternal wrath. So they will suffer for all eternity experiencing God in his wrath. So you have not escaped God in hell. Well, at least I go to hell and get rid of you. No, you ain't got rid of him. No. So that's for all you atheists. You still gonna get a good taste of God. But you're gonna get him in the wrong way. It's gonna be in his wrath. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12 says. Listen to this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with a span. Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure. And weighed the mountains in a scale. And the hills in a balance. <laughs> I know. That, that should make you think say this. See. Well. If you read your Bible. This helps you how to pray. Amen. Amen. How do you start off when you want to just glorify God? Look at what he just said. Who is like you, God? Right. Who measures the mountains in a balance? Right. You know, who, 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 who measures the earth in the hollow of his hand? That's you glorifying the magnificence and the majesty of God. There is none like him. In the Hebrew, the word span is the distance between the end of the thumb and the little finger. So what Isaiah says is God measures the universe in the span of his hand. Wow. So you don't know the size. Right. How big is the universe? Oh, you can't, can't calculate. The number is in, I think they call it, it's like a sextillion, so it's some ridiculous number. God says, oh, that's for the, for the middle finger. <laughs> that's, that's easy. What's your biggest mountain you got here? I put that in the balance. <laughs> the scripture talks about when Jesus touched down on the Mount of Olives, he's going to split the mountain in half. I want to let your whole foot, Jesus, when they told you. <laughs> Golly. The Bible talks about that. He, Jesus said, I'm coming on the clouds. Right. How do you do that? Right. I'm going to split the sky open. The, the book of Peter, uh, uh, Second Peter, says the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll. So, guys. Let's stop with the God is in the temple in heaven somewhere. No. So why is he giving him this type of language? When we read about the temple in heaven, or we read about the throne of God, or the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven, it is the Holy Spirit showing John these awesome spiritual visions using earthly reference points that he can comprehend yes. and then communicate to the church. Yes. Yes. You do understand that when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 4, here's what Paul says. I know this, and I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, verse 4, and he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter, or which is unspeakable, unlawful. Now watch this. The Greek word for unspeakable means unutterable words because it is beyond description. Why couldn't Paul say what he saw? There were no words to describe it. So how does John able to communicate to us what he saw? 
the Holy Spirit use earthly reference points right, right. that John could relate to right, in order to communicate it to us so me and Lindsay can understand it. Yeah. Because John can't just write down and I saw blah, 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 blah. I mean, he can't write down I don't know, I have no word for it. I don't know what I saw. That's why I love it when he talks about that translucent pavement under God. He said I saw as it were a sea of glass. Right. You realize what John is saying? I don't know what I saw. Okay. But it, it looked like glass. It looked like glass. And he had an emerald rainbow with jasper and glory. He, he just, you're trying your best to put in words things that are un, incomprehensible to us in our English language. I love what the great reformer John Calvin says. He says, God uses baby talk to talk to us. It's like us telling, asking scholars, do you have to go potty? <laughs> it would be a problem, though, if you saw my mom talking to me. That, John, you have to go potty? <laughs> You're using baby talk. <laughs> you see, and God uses baby talk to talk to us. Right. Because that's what our sin brought upon us. Right. Y'all follow it? That's why I love what John says in 1 John chapter 3. Y'all still with me? He says, when he returns, we don't know what manner we shall be. Right. But right. we know that we will be like him. All right. When he returns. In other words, John said, I don't know what we're going to be like. But I know we're going to be like him because we're going to be known. We're going to know, I'm sorry, even as we are known. All right. We will know even as we are known. Right now, we just don't know, guys. Glass dark. <laughs> exactly. We don't know. That's why, man, don't get caught up in all these heaven books that people write. All right. You know, you got all these people who go to heaven every day. They taking a trip every day. You know, you, you, you would think that it's an express lane to heaven. Everybody go. And what amazes me, everybody see something different, some foolishness. No, guys, don't believe that stuff. Because Paul, Paul says, I was not even able to put into words what I saw. John was able to put into words because the Holy Spirit gave John earthly reference points. What John sees is actually indescribable. But the Holy Spirit reveals these things to John in images he can actually describe and put into the words and words for edification of the church. That's why I told you the book of Revelation is written for the church. How in the world can John write something that we can't understand? So that go back to the speaking in tongues things. See, the speaking in tongues is not for the edification of the church. Because all speaking in tongues is, is speaking in another language. That's why when you spoke it, you had to have an interpreter. Tongues is not That's not tongues That's gibber jabberish and foolishness And nobody gets edified in that Because I don't know what you're saying If I came to Elder Charles And I stood up at the table He wanted me to bless the bill I said, Amen I don't even know what you said Well how about news for you Roscoe I don't know what I said Because I just made it up Because tongues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was it. Well, you know, I'm speaking in the language of angels. No. And here's the deal. Exactly. I don't know what angels, because we just talked about Abraham meeting with two angels. And, and then I didn't hear them call up to Abraham. No, they didn't do that to Abraham. They talked in whatever Hebrew. Right. That's right. When, the, when Gabriel appeared to Mary, he didn't go up in tongues. He didn't go up in some angelic tongue. She understood him. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. How about when God spoke to people in the Old Testament? They understood him. Yeah. Amen. They didn't need an interpreter. Mm -hmm. But only in today's foolishness of the church age now do we see this, 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 this fiasco. That like Paul says, that if an unbeliever wants to walk through the door yeah. and you're all speaking that gibberish, then he's going to say, aren't you all mad? Mm -hmm. 
and he will leave. I love what he says. He says, I would rather glorify God with five words than to speak 10,000 words that nobody knows what I'm saying. That's right. And I'm not talking about you speaking some gibber jabbish and then interpret your gibber jabbish. Whenever you see a preacher stand up before you and start speaking in some tongue and then he interpreted himself, run out. Yeah, mm. that's right. Because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, let that, okay, that's not even the right. 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 See, the Bible tells you how to do that and let another stand. Right. But the reason why nobody can inter interpret that because it's not a language. It's that's not real. Right. It's, it's made up. Mm. It's a person's active imagination. Mm. Jimmy, they're just repeating what you heard. Mm -hmm. uh, Come on now. All right. It's like a baby learning sight words. They don't know how to read. Mm -hmm. They just recognize the word because they, they they just know they just know the letter formation. They don't, they don't know how to read it. They they can't phonetically spell it out. Right, right. Come on. And that's what believers call tongues. It's not no language. It's it, it's just you repeating what you heard somebody else say. Yeah. <laughs> and you get your own secrets with it. That's, there you go. That's where you develop your own tongue. Uh, Okay. I'm sorry for that one. Look at this, guys. <laughs> no rabbit trail. <laughs> Let's go back to verse 55, 15, 5. But I think it was a good place to say that because what I'm trying to show you is the Holy Spirit is using language that we could understand. Yeah. That's why he talks about a temple in heaven. That's why he talks about a throne of God. I do not ever want you to think that when we get there, we're going to see God sitting on some Masonic looking throne. Right. Right. Some big chair in the middle. Like, see, that's how we think. You, you know, I grew up in the Methodist church. Some of you grew up in the Baptist church. You grew up in, in Koji or whatever. What? The preacher sat in the middle. He had the big chair, so that's the God chair. Yeah. Then you got Jesus, he in the little, the little oh. medium sized chair, and the Holy Spirit, he in the other little chair over here. You see, that's not the picture. See, that's how we think that when we go to heaven, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see some fiasco like that. God in the big Masonic looking chair with the big hands on it. No! Oh my God. No, <laughs> the throne room of God is a picture of his intimate presence. As believers, we will be around the throne. What does that mean? We will be around the most intimate presence of God. By grace, what does it say? We can come boldly oh, yes. to the throne of grace right, right. and receive mercy and help in our time of need. That's the that's a promise to the believer. That's, the that's a huge promise. Can you imagine telling an Old Testament Jew you can come boldly to the throne of grace? What? Right. Let him try to kick open the door to the Holy of Holies. Come on. Good <laughs> but as the believer, that's our promise. So, guys, when we talk, when, when John says he sees a t the, 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 the temple open and the tabernacle of witness open there, the only way you can understand it is you have to go back to the Old Testament and understand what those things, watch this, Roscoe, represented. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to do. What do they represent? Mm -hmm. What do they mean? And see, when you get that, this is how you can begin to teach, teach this. Now, watch this. The temple was a visible and physical place that represented to Israel the presence of God dwelling in the midst of his people. Mm -hmm. You follow that? Mm -hmm. God wanted to dwell in the midst of his people. Now God just can't just come down and just dwell. They all die. Right. Right. All of them die. Remember, we found out that in Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai. Right. What did God tell Moses in Exodus 19? He said, don't let them come up to this mountain. Right. He said, you don't even let a beast touch the mountain. Mm -hmm. he, he, he had to keep telling Moses. Why he, why Moses why not? he said, look, tell them to stop. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to break loose on them. I said, you think I'm making up the word? God said, I'm going to break loose on them. Mm -hmm. right. Tell them to stop. They can't come near him. Mm -hmm. Because why? They would die. So how does God dwell in the midst of his people? Mm -hmm. A temple. It's a symbol. That's what it represents. Now follow this, guys. So the temple had an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. Right. It was the holy of holies or the most holy place where the presence of God dwelled over the mercy seat right. 
on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Make sure you say it right. right. God yeah. didn't just fill up, okay, I don't want you to get the picture God was just filling up the Holy of Holies. Like, like nowhere, God was somewhere in the Holy of Holies sitting down. No, God told Moses, I dwell on top of the mercy seat, right. on top of the Ark, yeah. <laughs> in the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. it, was a per it was a reason why it's understood like that. And what we read here is, when we go to Revelation 15, 5, the word sanctuary there is the Greek word naos. Now, it, naos is not the word for just regular temple. Naos is the Greek word for the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. So what John sees in Revelation 15, 5, prior to the outpouring of God's wrath, is that the Holy of Holies was open. And inside, I saw the ark. Mm -hmm. And it was open. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to now you're looking right Now, you got to see something now. You say, okay, what's that? Not only is the Holy of Holies open, which no human in right. the Old Testament would see that. But now we got a real issue. Yes, we do. The ark open. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Come on. We're the mercy Come on. This is going to help you when you understand this. <clears throat> Look at this. This is amazing what John sees because no human besides the Levitical priesthood was allowed to look inside the Holy of Holies. Do you know if you lived in the Old Testament, you never saw inside the Holy of Holies? The only person who could see inside the Holy of Holies, you said high priest, not just the high priest, but the Levitical priesthood because they had to set it up. Okay, if you set it up, you did see inside it when you set it up. You do understand it. But it couldn't be me from the tribe of Judah saying, well, let me help, man. I'm sick. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Levi. I'm sick today. I'm going to have Lindsay fill in for me. Lindsay going to die. Because only the Levitical priesthood mm. could handle the, 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 the tabernacle of furniture. Y'all follow that? In Numbers chapter 1, verse 50, it says, <clears throat> but appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings, and they are to take care of it and shall camp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is set up, set out, I'm sorry, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp, each man by his own standard. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may be no wrath right. on the congregation of the people of Israel. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of testimony. Thus did the people of Israel. Uh, they did according to all the Lord had commanded. In Revelation 15, we see the Holy of Holies now flung open as God is about to pour his final wrath on the earth. Mm -hmm. This is significant because, like we said, of what is inside the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Because the phrase, the tabernacle of witness, is another name for the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. The Ark of the Covenant. And we know that the Ark of the Covenant set inside the Holy of Holies mm -hmm. and it had a mercy seat on top of it and you never looked inside of it. Right. You, ne you, you, ne you never did anything like that. Remember, go read 1 Samuel. Go read 1 Samuel. I think it's probably chapters 4 and 5 when the Philistines stole the, uh, stole the Ark. Mm -hmm. And they brought it into the city and they put it in, in the temple. You know, they just took the Ark of the Child. They put it in every day temple of Dagon. Right. Dagon was their God. Right. And what happened when they woke up, man? They woke up, man, and Dagon was on the ground laying before the temple. <laughs> so they picked up Dagon. Okay, man, something must happen. Maybe an earthquake happened and put Dagon back up. Came back the next night, Dagon was also on the ground, but his head was chopped off and his hands were gone. Yeah. He was just a stump. Yeah. And that's when they realized, here's what it said, we sinned. Because <laughs> oh, they were in the whoa, whoa. Israel got mad. <laughs> because that ark was important. Go read the story of Uzzah. What did he do? Yeah. He just went to balance the ark because it was getting ready to fall off of a car. And the Bible, and the Bible says that the Lord's anger kindled against Uzzah and struck him dead. Why did he do that? Because number one, the ark wasn't supposed to be on no new cart. God, we just read in Numbers, the ark is supposed to be born on the shoulders of the priest. 
And David recognized that he was wrong. And in Chronicles, we find out he made the correction and did it right. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the ark is not just some piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about these little fake arts we got in the church that you know, we try to sit something like that. No, that's not what I'm talking about. This is the real thing. This is the real thing. This is the real thing, guys. This isn't play play. This isn't pictionary. This is the real thing here. We need to get a seriousness about the Bible. I know we don't understand these things because we didn't live at that time, but this was serious. This represented the presence of God. This was his holy presence. And you didn't play around with that. This wasn't no joke. I, thank God for the grace that we have with the kids. They can run the pulpit. They can run around. You weren't running around the tabernacle like that. All right. Come on now. That's what made it so amazing about Jesus when Mary and Joseph couldn't find him. Where was Jesus? In the temple teaching. Right. Because why? Jesus, I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> wow, guys, look at Hebrews chapter 9. Y'all still with me, man? Isn't this amazing? Watch the Hebrews 9, verses 2 through 5. It says, For a tent was prepared. Now, Hebrews is going to give us the whole picture. It says, <clears throat> For a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. In other words, you have the outer courts and now you have the inner courts. In the inner courts, you had the lampstand, the menorah, the table of shoe bread, and then you had the golden altar there. And then it says, behind the second curtain was the second section called the most holy place. Now, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, uh, in which was, and now he's going to tell us what was inside the ark right. when they first put it in there. Okay, what was inside of it? Oh, just a little chest. No, what was inside of it? Number one, it was a golden urn holding the manna. Mm -hmm. Holding manna. In other words, when, they had, when God gave the manna, he told Moses, take a little bit of the manna and put it in the golden urn and put it inside the ark. I'm going to tell you why they did it. The second thing in the ark was Aaron's right. staff that buddy. That's right. That was important because that was during the core of uh, uh, the rebel of Korah. We'll talk about that. And then the last thing in the ark was the Ten Commandments. Amen. Mm. Come on. So these three things said inside the ark. Now we know that by the time Solomon built his temple in 1 Kings chapter 9, it tells us that the only thing inside the ark at that time was the tables. And staff and buddy, we don't know what happened to that one. And, and the golden pot of man, I guess somebody ate it. I don't know. You know, it, it wasn't there anymore. And by the time, did you know this? By the time Jesus walked the earth, during his time, there was no ark inside the Holy of Holies. Right. Because when, when Jerusalem was sacked in 586, the rumor is that Jeremiah yes. hid the ark. A lot of people believe he hid it in Ethiopia. We don't know. A lot of people believe that Solomon has so many corridors written up under the temple that somebody is there. But one of the great things is that a lot of the Jews are claiming today, certain Messianic Jews are claiming that they know exactly where the ark is and it's going to be, it's going to appear one day. They know exactly where it is. A lot of the Ethiopian tribes who are Ethiopian Jews, they claim they have it. Right. But what we know is by the time Jesus was there in the temple, there was no ark. They were just sprinkling blood in a hole. Because the ark was gone. So watch this. Go to verse. Go, go back to Revelation 15. So now, these those. What were the three items that were placed inside the ark? Amen. You have the manna, and the staff that budded, and the Ten Commandments. Please remember that because you're going to see why right now. Now watch this in Revelation 15, uh, 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 verse five and six. Let's read those two verses together. I'll read them. It says, "After this, I looked." And the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. These are not high priest angels. <laughs> what they're talking about is they, are, they, they represent royalty. They represent divinity. They represent holiness and purity. But the creed that I want you to see is where did they come out of? They came out of the sanctuary. That's not saying they came out of the big temple. They came out of the Holy of Holies. So what do we know? They came out of the very what? Presence of God. 
That's where they had been. Remember, Gabriel tells us in Luke chapter 1, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Y'all follow that? So these angels are letting us know that what they're doing is directly out from God. God's final wrath comes out of his divine glory and holiness that mankind has rebelled against, rejected, and scorned. I'm going to show you. Because remember, when John sees the vision, he sees the holy of holies open mm -hmm. and the ark open. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. The first thing in there was the golden pot of manna. That was placed inside the ark, Lindsay, to cover Israel's rebellion against God's provision for them right. in the wilderness. That's right. hmm. Why did they put a golden pot of manna in the ark? It was to cover Israel's rebellion against God's provision. Hmm. Now watch this. The true manna right. that God has provided for mankind is Jesus Christ. John chapter 6 which man has rebelled against and rejected and scorned in favor for the false kingdom of the beast and his provision. So in other words, now the ark is open. Israel rebelled, and God put it inside the ark and covered it with the mercy seat. Now guess what? Oh, you reject my provision? <laughs> Wrath is coming. Okay, y'all understand. God's not mad because they rejected some manna. No, the right. true manna is Jesus. Right. Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. And man has rejected Jesus. In this time, man has rejected Jesus for who? The Antichrist. So God's judgment against mankind is just because they have rejected God's provision. What else is the thing in there? The staff of Aaron. That budded. Now watch this. That was placed inside the ark to cover Israel's rebellion against the high pointed, the, the appointed high priest during the rebellion of Korah. What happened in the rebellion of Korah in number 16? Go read number 16. Korah came up to Moses and said, why should you be over us? Who made you in charge? Who are you? God can speak to everybody. He speaks to everybody. Why we got to listen to you? And Moses then takes that to God and says, okay, God, I, he says, tomorrow, everybody come out here and we're going to see who God speaks to. And here's what he said. You will know who God speaks to because if God does a new thing and the earth swallows up and swallows them whole, then you'll know that God is with me. Guess what happened? The Spirit told God, told Moses, get away from these people. Right? Mm. Get away from them. And I can just imagine, you saw everybody just kind of stepping back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then Moses put out an announcement. All y'all who don't want to be a part of this, move away from them right now. And the Bible says the ground opened up and swallowed 23,000 of them. Went down straight to hell. Mm. And then guess what God said after that? He says, here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to take Aaron's staff that budded. Right. And I want you to put that in the ark. Mm. And put it, put the mercy seat on it, because it represented Israel's rebellion against God's appointed priests. And God says, "I want to put it in there so I can cover it." The ark is now open. That means the staff is seen, because the true high priest is not Aaron. Right. The true high priest is Jesus, who mankind has rejected in favor of the false prophet. Wow. Wow. Am I confusing you? Mm -mm. <laughs> Just like Israel rejected their high priest, but watch this, Mom. God covered it. How did he cover it? By putting it in the ark and putting a mercy seat on top of it. Come on. Ain't no mercy seat now. Now, that staff is just shown, and it's, it's showing you that mankind, oh, you rejected my, my, my high priest? Well, who did they choose? The false prophet. And then what was the last thing in the ark? And we're done, guys. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, was placed inside of the ark. Now, come on, y'all should know this story. When did God place the Ten Commandments inside the ark? At what? The golden calf. Uh -huh. Remember when Moses came down? He saw him party hard and loose and booty. They just having all a good time, man. And then what does he do? He takes the tablets and he throws them on the ground because they're worshiping the golden calf. 
and then he has to go back up on the mountain for another 40 days right. and, go to, and he gets a new set of tablets. Mm. And here's what God says. Ah, take them tablets and put them inside the ark. No, but don't even bring them in the midst of the camp. Put them inside the ark, put the mercy seat on top of it. So what did that represent? Israel's rebellion against God and his law. Well, guess what? The mercy seat's gone. The ark is open. What does that represent? Humanity has willfully chosen to disregard God's law and blaspheme the name of God. How are they doing that, Lindsay? In the worship of the dragon. So man has chosen the dragon, the false prophet, and the beast. The unholy trinity. They've rejected Christ. They've rejected God. And God says, now there is nothing but wrath. Because guess what? There is no mercy seat that John saw. There's nothing covering God's holiness. Because they have rejected Jesus Christ and have willfully aligned themselves with the false kingdom of the beast and the false prophet and the dragon, humanity will now drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength. My God. The great tribulation will be a time when there will be, listen to this guys, no mercy given to sinners. My God. Mm -hmm. Again, Elder Charles, we have no reference for that. Do you know y'all, y'all, we have no reference for no mercy. We're living in a world today that is just full of mercy. Yeah. Do y'all understand that? Do y'all really, do you understand that a time is coming when there will be no mercy for sinners? No, no, no mercy. No, that's why you're telling your loved ones, no mercy. No mercy. That means, man, you can pray to God all you want to. God's like, I'm done. It's over. And you say, I'll never do that. You have not read your Old Testament. Because when Israel turned to those other gods, you wonder what God said to Jeremiah? He says, tell them to pray to Baal. Tell them to pray to Baal and ask Baal to save them. That's exactly what he said. There's no salvation. And guess what? When, when, when Babylon came in there, man, they killed those. The, the famine was so bad in Jerusalem, they were eating their babies. There's no mercy. There's a time coming when there will be no mercy on the land. And look at this as we finish. Go back to verse 7, 15, 7. And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. Oh, my God. Now, let me give you this right quick. The word bowl in the Greek is not like a bowl you think. This ain't no cereal bowl. This word in the Greek is really like a shallow saucer. And, and, and when I studied it out, it's amazing. What it's signifying you is these, these angels are given like these saucer dishes to where they pour it out. Watch this. It, it's, it's a dumping. And, 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 and let me make sure this is close. Good. It's a dumping. It's literally when God dumped them, when the wrath comes, he just turn it over. Mm. You know, you ever took a cup of water and poured it, and just turn it over. It just splat, it just splatted them. So, poof! That's literally what this wrath will be like. When God's final wrath hits the earth, it will be instantaneous devastation that comes one after the other, mm. rapid fire fashion. So when it says that, and God turned all the seas into blood, Elder Charles, and all the fish like that, boom, gone. Mm. It's not going to be one fish flying around, oh, no, he looked like he died. No, 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 boom. It's over. Mm. It's a deluge. Mm. Isaiah chapter 24 says the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. He's not going to empty the earth of people. He's going to empty the earth of sinners. Mm. And look at the last part. Verse 8. Mm -hmm. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Mm -hmm. Immediately what comes to mind, guys, is what? The Old Testament of when the glory of God filled the tabernacle and the glory of God filled the temple. Y'all remember those stories? In Exodus chapter 40, it talks about then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. That was during the time of Moses. Look at what happened with Solomon. You guys know the story. Mm -hmm. And when the priest came out of the high place, a cloud, I'm sorry, the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. 
Watch this, Lizzie. The glory of God filled the earthly temple, tabernacle and temple as a representation of God's presence dwelling amongst his people. In Revelation 15, 8, the glory of the Lord fills the heavens as his power and wrath are put on full visible display now. You want to know what we're going to be doing while God is devastating the earth? We're going to be worshiping and praising God yes. Yes. for his holiness and his glory. Mm -hmm. Man. That's why we shed a tear now for the unsaved. Mm -hmm. That's why we cry out to them now, auntie. Yeah. We beg them mm -hmm. because a time is coming yeah. when there will be no begging. Mm -hmm. We will be praising the Lord as he lays waste the earth mm -hmm. because it is his glory that is being revealed. Guys, this is where the path of sinners lead. This is it. This is where they're going. And I think it's just because for over 2,000 years now, we've never seen anything like that. And watch this, Raymond. During the tribulation, what can they say? In the tribulation time, they can't. nothing else will be said either about it. Because how many times during the tribulation will God show himself? Think about it, guys. Look at this, man. For over 2,000 years, God has been displaying his glory in his mercy and grace and salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection. We're in that now. <clears throat> For over 2,000 years, God has given fallen humanity a way of escape in the person and works of Jesus Christ. And during the tribulation, God will definitively reveal to mankind that he is the Lord God Almighty. They're going to know him. How do you say that? Number one, God will supernaturally remove his church. So millions of believers will just suddenly and instantaneously vanish. Mm. <laughs> if you're an unbeliever, Uncle Charles, and I know my believing family gone, they going to kind of prove to you that they were right and you were wrong. <laughs> so that's one act of grace. Number two, God will supernaturally commission 144,000 Jewish evangelists that will spread out across the earth and preach the good news of Jesus. Oh, Lord. Number three, God will supernaturally empower two witnesses right. with supernatural abilities to preach the good news of the return of Christ for the world for three and a half years. Right, right, right. Number four, millions upon millions of people will be turning to Christ and preaching salvation all across the world. And we will know it because they're going to be killed for their testimony in Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Number five, God will commission an angel mm -hmm. to preach the gospel mm -hmm. every day at noon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guys, we don't have this now. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. If we were given all of these real signs, not to mention that God is going to open up the supernatural realm where there will be spiritual beings, angelic beings. All of that's going to be known now. What is the excuse for the tribulation? No, they're willfully rejected. We don't have it now. We don't have all this stuff now like this. We're truly believing by faith. During this time, not only do they have to believe by faith, but they're going to be experiencing all these great and just things, not to mention all the cataclysmic things that are happening on the earth. Amen. And you still reject? No. Well, God is showing you my wrath is just. And it will be just during that time. Because man will have willfully rejected me for the last time. And the only thing left is the great wire press of my wrath. And guess what, guys? When we get to Revelation 16, which begins next, put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Because it's rapid fire fashion. At this point, this is the woman getting ready to have birth. You know, I remember Liz was having Skylar, the, the contractions will fall apart. But boy, the closer Skylar came. Y'all look at that blue machine. Y'all know y'all women know, man. When you knew that baby was coming, them contractions, they were coming back to back to back to back to back to back. That's literally what the great tribulation is. It's back to back. You ain't got time to catch a baby. And it starts off with a bang. It starts off with God bringing out a, a stinky boils. On everybody who worships mm, peace. God. Starts off with a bang, you know, Charles. Immediately they're going to be walking around boiling. Oh, what a dear. Yeah. So 
We'll read it. So get ahead of me. Start reading 16. Go ahead and start studying now, and we'll be a part of it. Amen. Come on. Amen. Let's get ready to go. Amen. Don't leave uh, after church, too. I got a quick thing I want to say, and we'll uh, get out of here. Hallelujah, guys. Thank you for joining with us there uh, on, uh, on Facebook and our uh, YouTube page. Bro, you guys get to find it there. Uh, please share out the broadcast. These are powerful truths. And uh, I'm telling you, man, there's so much here that we could spend all year just highlighting one verse because the scripture is so packed with truth. But please join with us as we continue to walk through our study on Wednesday as we answer tough questions. We want you to be a part of that as well. And uh, we hope that you're uh, blessed and, and we'll see you on the next go-round.